All right, everyone, my clock shows four o'clock. I hope that's uh, correct and that uh, others are able to now join us. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know it's a busy time with the uh, UN General Assembly going on. We've called you all together today for a discussion around protecting human rights during the COVID-19 crisis and beyond, digital pandemic surveillance and the right to privacy. And of course, as I said, this is an event happening in connection with the UN General Assembly 75. Thank you all so much for joining us. We look forward to a very uh, a compelling and interesting panel today. Uh, we want to first start by thanking those of, uh, who have made this uh, event possible, our co-organizers at Access Now and UN Global Pulse, and our co-sponsors, the Republic of Korea, the European Union, Finland, and France. I should let you all know that this event is being broadcast on the YouTube channel of Access Now, as well as on UN Web TV, um, and will be recorded. For those of you who may want to ask questions, we're going to do our best to leave uh, a little bit of time at the end for questions. If you have one, please use the YouTube chat function to record. Um, we clearly, I'm sure, will not be able to get to all the questions, but we will definitely make note of them. Um, so please put any, any questions in there. We've called you together today because uh, we really believe that there are serious implications for increased surveillance on human rights during and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's an important moment for us to come together and discuss them. Um, we hope this conversation will allow us to narrow in on new technologies such as contact tracing, the use of biometric and health related data and other technological interventions that have been used during the pandemic. And really to help us look at some of the best practices, the ongoing questions regarding how we use and uh, protect personal data and promote digital rights uh, during this fight against the pandemic and beyond. Obviously, in having this conversation, we draw on and rely on a foundation going forward from a number of, of important uh, other initiatives, including, of course, the Secretary General's roadmap on digital cooperation and his call to action on human rights, which has a, a chapter specifically looking at the frontier issues, including the digital space. We also wanted to say a word to acknowledge the ongoing efforts by uh, Brazil and Germany uh, who have led efforts on the right to privacy at the United Nations, including here at the Human Rights Council, uh, where they sponsor a resolution on the topic and, and realize that we're building very much on their work and looking forward to an event that they'll sponsor later this month. So with that brief introduction, I'd like to turn to our First uh, speaker who will give introductory remarks. We're very happy to have with us Ambassador Silvio Gonzata, uh, Gonzato, uh, who's the deputy head of the European Union delegation in uh, for the UN in New York. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you, Peggy, and uh, welcome to all um, from New York. Um, well, you know, welcome to this uh, important discussion on how we can protect human rights. Uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, but also looking beyond this crisis and talking about, you know, how um, tools like, uh, you know, pandemic surveillance tools uh, can be reconciled with the right to privacy, a topic which is very dear to the European Union. So let me thank Access Now, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and UN Global Pulse for taking this initiative. I think it's very important. In the wake, as you were saying, Peggy, of the Secretary General's uh, roadmap on digital cooperation, but also uh, of his call to action that we should not forget. I think we should keep uh, you know, our attention focused on the call to action and its different strands of work. Uh, we as European Union were one of the co-champions co of the UN SG roadmap, and we're proud to be here uh, with other co-sponsors, uh, in particular Finland, and we are honored to have a video message by the minister, uh, France and the Republic of uh, Korea. I'm also looking forward, like all of us, to the discussion with the experts that you've gathered around this virtual table. And I think that today's discussion takes place at a time when we are celebrating the 75th anniversary. And looking back, you know, even if the existing human rights treaties date back to a pre-digital era, we all know that human rights exist uh, online as much as they do offline and that they need to be respected. And it's not also by chance that the event takes place today. This is the day when the third committee has its opening section, session. We uh, sincerely hope that the committee will live up to our expectations and that the resolution on the right to privacy 
which is facilitated by our German and Brazil colleagues, will address the concerns that we are addressing today. You know, nothing is changing our world so quickly as the digital transformation. It affects every aspect of our economy and of our societies. And I think that the pandemic showed this even more vividly. The pandemic and the measures taken to fight it had and are, and are having serious consequences on human rights around the world. We've been saying this very clearly. The pandemic should not be used as a pretext to limit democratic and civic, civic space, nor should it be used to restrict the work of human rights defenders, journalists, media workers, and civil society organizations. But the pandemic is also showing us the great potential that new technologies can have for the fulfillment and protection of human rights. For instance, new technologies have allowed billions of children and youth to have access to education when the vast majority of schools and universities were closed. And these technologies have also facilitated the right to work, to work remotely, also access to culture at a time when all the cultural establishments were closed, or to health. Um, more specifically, with regard to health, new technologies have been essential to uphold the right to health, for instance, by allowing researchers around the world to exchange findings on treatments or by tracing the spread of the virus. On the other hand, as we all know, tracing apps have been at the heart of a very heated debate around the world. Serious concerns have emerged regarding their potential misuse and potential data privacy breaches. So several member states of the European Union have quickly developed applications to trace and contain the virus, particularly in hotspot areas. But in order to ensure that these new measures were in line with universal rights and freedoms, the EU developed, toolbox, uh, the EU developed a toolbox last April, which provides guidance to EU governments on the use of mobile applications for contact tracing and warning in response to the coronavirus pandemic. And we have continued to update technical guidance in this respect. The guidance to member states is clear. Tracing apps must be voluntary, they must be secure and interoperable and respect people's privacy. Apps should be used, should use arbitrary identifiers to avoid the identification of users and should not use geolocation or movement data since they're not necessary, since they, uh, they are not recommended for the purpose of contact tracing. In addition, all applications have to be temporary only, so they will have to be dismantled as soon as the pandemic is over and should retain data only for the strictly minimum period of time. The guidance that we've given, which is in line with the EU General Data Protection Regulation, guarantees that citizens have sufficient protection of their personal data and limitation of intrusiveness. We are ready to share this expertise with other UN member states who are interested, and we are ready also to work in identifying global digital solutions that are informed and respectful of human rights. So having said this, uh, I think it's time to uh, pass the floor to uh, our uh, Finnish uh, minister and over to you, Peggy. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And it's you've gotten us off to a good start by really setting forward some of the key principles and the way that the European Union has looked at these critical issues. And we appreciate your offer of, of further engagement going forward. As you mentioned, we're very fortunate to the government of Finland has uh, allowed us to have with us uh, virtually today uh, Minister Ville Skinari, the Minister for Development, Cooperation and Foreign Trade of Finland. Uh, Finland has been very active in shaping the development of and the follow-up to Recommendation 3C on artificial intelligence from the uh, Secretary General's roadmap and is uh, the co-champion of the Secretary General's related 3C roundtable on AI. So we're very proud to, to have a video from Minister Skinari and over to the video now. Thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, digitalization has the potential to enhance health and well-being, as well as economic and social resilience. It's crucial in promoting sustainable development and human rights. The COVID-19 pandemic has pushed an unprecedented digital leap in a matter of months. 
It has demonstrated tremendous opportunities from digitalization for health security. Countries around the world have taken different approaches to ramp up digital means for pandemic response. Data is fuel for technologies such as contact tracing and data sharing. At the same time, the pandemic has also underlined the importance of addressing human rights, ethics and data privacy concerns. We must ensure that digitalization respects the right to privacy and human agency. In Finland, the voluntary COVID-19 tracing app was launched for public use in September. Our citizens can use this application unanimously and no identifiable personal data is collected. The development of the app required legislative changes and was coupled with the broad whole of society dialogue. The app has now been downloaded by over 2.2 million Finns, which is quite a remarkable figure in a country of 5.5 million people. This also speaks volumes about the underlying necessity of such an app, trust. It's also important to address the impacts of new technologies on the rights of all women and girls. We must integrate gender equality and non-discrimination in the development of such technologies. For this reason, Finland is co-leading the Action Coalition responsible for the promotion of technology and innovation for gender equality as a part of the UN Women's Generation Equality Campaign. Finland is also proud to champion the recommendations on artificial intelligence of the Secu Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation as well as his subsequent roadmap. This reflects our long-term commitment to digital cooperation and innovation. This event is co-hosted with France, the Republic of Korea, the European Union, as well as the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, UN Global Pulse and Access Now. We hope to contribute to charting the way towards sustainable digital trans 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 transformation that is compatible with human rights. With these words, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to to for today's discussion on human rights in times of COVID-19 and beyond. Thank you. Thanks very much to Minister Scanari for that intervention. It was very good to hear those words from him about Finland's experience in particular and uh, the numbers in terms of uh, his contact tracing app. I'm sure we'll get into more uh, discussion around the various uh, contact tracing possibilities and, and how they've worked. So let's move right on to that section of our, of our program. We have with us five esteemed experts who will take on those issues from different perspectives. Um, and uh, with the hope of giving them all as much time as possible to speak, I'll keep the introductions of each of them brief, but uh, you'll have their expertise uh, in front of you. So first I'd like to give the floor to Patricia Aduse Poku, who is the commissioner and executive director of Ghana's Data Protection Commission. Uh, which is within the Ministry of ICT for Ghana. We're so fortunate to have you with us, Patricia. And we're hoping you can tell us a bit about the development and deployment of Ghana's contact tracing app, as well as your sense of the effectiveness and compliance with data protection principles and uh, whatever makes sense from your perspective on those issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and hello all. Um, it's a very interesting time for uh, Ghana and for Africa as a region in, in managing a pandemic pandemic of this stage, because the pandemic has arrived at a time when data protection is very new to the region and, and, and to Ghana. And whilst we are trying to educate our data controllers locally to understand and, and also want actively to be uh, 
uh, accountable to the people they serve and to comply with the main principles of data protection and the requirements of our law, the pandemic has arrived. So in the midst of that, we're having to test out uh, practically the understanding and the, uh, and the willingness for uh, data controllers to be accountable to the people. Uh, yes, and Ghana has put together a tracking uh, tool to, to help with the management of the pandemic. And that is in compliance with an executive instrument that was passed by the president of Ghana that allows the Ministry of Health and the, crit the critical stakeholders to use the tracking app to support the tracking of individuals and to have a nationwide uh, safeguarding of uh, the well-being of people using the tracker. There are several pros and cons from the perspective of the commission in the use of a tracker, which I have seen resonating with the, the, the rest of our peer commissioners globally. I have recently joined the Global Assembly for Privacy, and now I'm doing this with the UN group formed here, all discussing this same topic. And last week, I had the Council of Europe, uh, uh, members of the Council of Europe uh, Department for human rights and all the members of the countries that have assigned to comply with the international uh, best practice as set by the Convention 108 plus, uh, agreeing to a declaration on a position on the, uh, the, the management of COVID-19. And you see the same uh, issues coming up, transparency, uh, how do we protect the rights of individual within the pandemic and, and, and reduce, minimize the risk of harm and distress to individuals whilst we try to manage their well-being. And the, the, the situation is not, this, it's not different. It's the same as the global situation that we find everywhere. We are working with the Ministry of Communication that is leading uh, the, the use of this uh, tool and, and continuously educating them on the use of minimum uh, uh, data possible uh, ensuring that there's transparency to data subjects on inquiries, enabling an additional uh, higher level of uh, tracking the, the appropriateness of the technology and basically adhering to the requirements of the principle. But I believe the, the, tr the true evaluation of the use of the tracker system will happen uh, hopefully post the pandemic when we are able to look back and retrospectively assess how information was collected and how much of it whether proper retention plans have been put in place and how we go about decommissioning the system that I've seen recommendations all over, also in the Access Now document, asking for these things to be uh, in place, that there was such a rush to put something in place that uh, I think Ghana is not uh, isolated from the, West, the rest of the world about how this tracker has been used. And I want, I want to uh, say that we are in sync with the, the key recommendations and we have made sure that the team are aware of these recommendations, but I think the full evaluation will happen post pandemic period. And I, I am very interested in hearing what my peers on this call would say and, and, and whether we, are, uh, we can count ourselves abreast with the, uh, the advice that is going on in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I think uh, very accurately uh, told us some of the challenges that so many countries across the globe have faced with the need to sort of move, you know, very quickly into a technology that that obviously uh, isn't a simple one and has some complications that we need to, to keep in mind and trying to figure out how best we do that while keeping ahead of uh, a global pandemic. And, and it'll be interesting, as you said, to hear from others about how they've met those challenges going forward. So the next person on our panel is actually somebody who's been directly involved in uh, the technology around one of those contact tracing apps. We're very fortunate to have with us Alexandria Walden, who's the Global Policy Lead for Human Rights and Free Expression at Google and works uh, for Google as well as the representative at the Global Network Initiative. And she's been involved, as I said, in Google and Apple's development and rollout of the COVID-19 contact tracing apps. So we're looking forward to hearing, Alex, about that work and in particular your approach to baking in some of the contact tracing protocols, strict limitations on data sharing 
and recognizing that some have considered that that might interfere with state efforts to, to use the data uh, to help combat uh, COVID-19. So really interested to hear how you respond to, to those issues and how Google and Apple looked at uh, those, those difficult uh, questions in, in coming up with this contact tracing app. Over to you, Alex. Thanks, Peggy. Um, so as Peggy said, I serve as a global head of human rights for Google. So in my work, I advise the company on how we can preserve our deep commitment to human rights, including free expression, access to information and privacy um, in a complicated global operating environment. Um, so this is an unprecedented moment. Every day people turn to Google for our products to help, to help them access important information, to stay productive while working and learning from home, to stay connected to people um, who they care about across the world. Um, in my time with you today, I'd like to share a few examples of how Google's pursuing projects that can be helpful to our users, um, to our partners, to customers, to communities, to governments, um, as part of how we are helping to address the coronavirus situation and as, as it continues to evolve. Human rights considerations have been critical to our approach. So I wanna highlight two examples of our work in this area. First, our work on community mobility reports and second, our work on exposure notifications. First, on uh, community mobility reports, which was the first um, product that we released uh, in order to address some of the things that we were seeing around uh, COVID-19. We heard from public health officials that um, the ty this type of aggregated anonymized data would be helpful to them as they made critical decisions around COVID-19. Particularly, we heard from officials that um, they were struggling to find data related to how people were moving and responding to social distancing guidelines. Um, the officials that we spoke to said that these types of insights around how, how populations were moving would be useful in understanding how to make changes um, based on those changing trends um, and how they would enact policies related to those, making decisions about transit offering or grocery hours um, or other kind of access to space and assembly. So in April, we began publishing um, regularly something called the COVID-19 Community Mobility Reports. That helped provide insight into how, um, what trends there were in the way that people were visiting locations like homes, how they were sheltering in place, um, and whether or not we were making progress in flattening the curve. These reports were developed while adhering to our stringent privacy protocols and our policies. The reports use aggregated anonymized data and they chart the movement of trends over time by geography and across different high level categories of places. So recreational spaces, um, places like grocery stores or pharmacies, parks, transit stations, um, and residential areas. So it shows those trends over a period of weeks so that you can compare. And while we display the percentage of increase and decrease in visits, we don't share absolute numbers of visits. Um, and so we do that to protect users' privacy. And we thought that this was an interesting way where we could bring our technology to bear um, while also ensuring that we were protecting people's privacy. We were not using personal data we weren't using people's individual locations or contacts or movements um, at any point. Um, so I'll move on and talk about our second project, which is exposure notifications. Exposure notifications um, was an endeavor jointly by Google and Apple to um, that derived out of our shared sense of responsibility to help governments and our global community fight this pandemic um, by focusing on contact tracing. Of course, traditional methods of contact tracing are critical and um, technology can't replace that, but technology can help support and augment these efforts by allowing public health officials to quickly notify people who may have been exposed um, and it allows them to know directly. This starts with exposure notifications on device and it helps public health authorities alert folks about their potential exposures. Um, and the key piece about this is that this entire project and this product was built with privacy protections in mind from the design phase. So the exposure notification API is designed specifically to take care 
of protecting the privacy of users while also sort of maximizing on the ability to help public health authorities and governments manage countries' re attempts to reopen. Um, the policies that we put in place to govern this project are really the key in how we thought about how to manage our human rights related expectations around the product. So developers aren't allowed to access the API unless they are a government public health authority or building an app on behalf of a government. We require developers to prove that they are or have been approved by the government. Um, and so what that does is both ensure that um, we know who is developing a particular app, but then also really helps protect us against other aspects around medical misinformation um, that has also been a challenge um, in the COVID-19 context. Developers also have to agree to our terms of service in order to use the API. And that comes with strict requirements around a number of things. First, developers have to meet a set of standards to ensure that strict privacy protections, including data minimization, um, with respect to COVID-19, that they're not collecting data through this app for law enforcement or punitive purposes and not using the app or the data collected for it, from the app for advertising. Um, apps that use exposure, the exposure notification API are also prohibited from requesting the permission to access some types of information that would otherwise normally be available. Um, this includes location and contact information Use of the API is also limited to supporting COVID-19 response efforts. So that was an important consideration that we had to ensure that um, the apps that we were hosting as part of this project are really focused specifically on solving COVID-19 related problems. And uh, we have other avenues to kind of address different issues that governments might uh, seek to do through, through an app and through our Play Store. We're also limited access to the API to one country per one app per country, unless the country had um, sort of communicated to us that they were taking a regional or a state approach. Um, and the purpose of that is to avoid fragmentation and reduce um, that would likely significantly reduce the effectiveness. And last is that apps can't require that people share their racial, ethnic, religious, disability, gender, sexual orientation, or other sensitive status. Um, and any data collected in the app can't be used to discriminate or marginalize in an individual or group related way. So all of those things are things that we felt were important to make explicit um, as part of the terms of service to ensure that um, any, any entity that was using our API to create an app wasn't going to be able to do that to, um, to help facilitate human rights harms against people. Um, and I just wanted to underscore that this, the building of this technology really reflects a wide range of input from experts um, that, that helped us focus on control for the users to ensure that they had the ability to opt in. Uh, privacy, as I explained, all of the ways in which um, so only some data is collected and we have um, strict rules around what may not be. And then lastly, about transparency, that the technology is only used for fighting COVID-19 and will, and will be disabled on a regional basis as, as the disease becomes contained. Um, so lastly, because I'm sure that I'm at time, I just want to underscore the key role of human rights standards and human rights experts in the development of these initiatives. At Google, we're always paying close attention to key human rights guidance uh, when building these solutions and our policies and implementing them, we undertook human rights due diligence, of course, um, which is something that we always do. In this case, we consulted specific guidance like the Syracuse of principles, um, and that really helped us understand how we should be thinking about these products in the context of a public health crisis. Uh, and in addition, we are lucky to have um, human rights expert partners that were developing guidance at the same time. So just to call out Access Now's recommendations on privacy and um, data protection in the fight against COVID-19 and the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and their COVID-19 privacy and civil rights principles were all important um, guidance that we took into consideration as we were building these things and as we've continued to uh, roll them out. So uh, 
again, you know, I think that that's an important, the exposure notifications product was um, an important way, an important illustration of how companies can work together to solve these really um, important global challenges. So uh, I will stop there and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Alex. You've given us a lot to think about and, and uh, an insight really into some of the, the thinking that, that went on behind the scenes. Uh, we actually have uh, as our next speaker, uh, our representative from Access Now. So I think we'll get uh, our perspective from the civil society side now from Fanny um, Hidfegi. Uh, we're so glad to have you with us, Fanny. You're, she's the European policy manager for Access Now. And as Alex just shouted out, uh, the, they've done lots of work uh, on these issues generally, but also very much in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think we've all benefited from their expertise and drawn on uh, their uh, analysis on these issues. So uh, over to you, Fanny, thanks. Thank you very much. Just double checking if you can hear me okay. It's fine, thanks. Great. So, well, first of all, that um, recommendation is the result of our data protection team's work and our fantastic lead on data protection, who is my colleague, Estelle Massé. So thank you very much for this opportunity to be here with you today. Um, we tend to talk a lot about trust when we are discussing the relationship people have toward governments, different institutions or technology. Trust, however, is a, just a euphemistic way of talking about power. If I'm in a relative power imbalance, then the one in power uh, really does not need my trust. They just need systems in place to maintain and reinforce the same power relationships we've always been in. People belonging to minorities and underrepresented groups have always experienced this, even in democratic countries and societies. COVID-19 has changed the landscape a bit, and for the first time in recent times, the majority of societies also have uh, felt this dynamic. At the same time, the pandemic, both from a health perspective and also in its financial and human rights implications, have impacted different people and groups in disproportionate manner. The past six, seven months have proven and confirmed that people don't have any reason to trust most governments who at best have been incompetent under the circumstances of a legitimately multifaceted crisis. And at worst, they have used the crisis to centralize and cement their power and limit human rights offline and online. We have seen a trend for different forms of censorship, using existing and enacting new criminal offenses for spreading misle misleading information now related to COVID-19 in Ethiopia, in Italy, in France, Malaysia, Pakistan, the Russian Federation, the UK, Spain, the list continues. These laws have a chilling effect by default, but we have seen them being activated and people were taken into custody for expressing their opinion online in places like Venezuela and Hungary. Restrictions of freedom of information are frequent, despite the fact that access to authoritative information is essential to stay alive and to save lives. We've documented this in the form of internet shutdowns in Myanmar, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh or Belarus. And there are new limitations on freedom of information laws in practices in countries like Brazil, the United States, Hungary. We've seen protests being banned beyond the health limitations in countries like Kenya. Governments have introduced emergency powers, in some cases without sunset clauses or other procedural safeguards to return to normalcy. It, again, the list is wide from Hungary, Romania, Slovakia, Tunisia, Palestine, Israel, Chile, and Ecuador. Politicians have been using the momentum to push for immunity certificates and digital ID systems and different forms of surveilling public spaces around the world, including Hong Kong, India, and the United Kingdom. And it's not just the government side, but the technology aspect has not been too much better either. At Access Now, we understand and we highlighted in these recommendations that were mentioned that the use of data and technology is not an if, but a how. We don't need to be afraid of technology, but we should also not look at it as our savior or as an ultimate solution, as the failures of exposure notification applications in Europe have shown us. One key challenge for these exposure notification applications have been the uptake or usage. 
opinions vary greatly on the percentage of people needed to use the apps for it to be effective. The range is somewhere between 15%, according to some ex experts, and some say it would need two thirds of the population. Even the most successful ones in Finland and Iceland are around 30 to 40% downloads and usage. Interestingly, the privacy and data protection approach not necessarily show the difference in people's um, willingness to use. In both uh, France and Germany, countries that chose different approaches to their models have a very low uptake. In addition to the uptake problem, we've seen difference between, um, yes, okay, maybe people once click on it and download, but then don't use it. There's quite a lot of inconsistency in behavior, cost can skyrocket, and cross-border interoperability is not entirely solved. In addition to the actual exposure notification applications problems, we are really struggling with having uh, available, available testing for the general public. And then it really questions why should we even bother with the app? For now, the impact of these apps to help mitigate the health crisis remains unproven. And this matters from a legal and human rights perspective in the following way, to ensure that a health crisis does not result in or being turned into a human rights crisis. Without restating the well-known details of international human rights standards, the first question with any restriction, whether it's a quarantine, a closure of a business, or an exposure notification application, the first question is if it can achieve a stated objective. To make it the least intrusive to privacy and data protection only becomes relevant after this first question. The huge effort that has gone into the design of protocols that respect data protection are extremely important. But the privacy community also risked to be used to legitimize the use, usage of these apps without having answers to that first question. Professor Harari had a spot on and quite particular, uh, sorry, popular quote, asking people to choose between privacy and health is in fact the very root of the problem because this is a false choice. We can and should enjoy both privacy and health. We must learn from these mistakes and not fall in the trap of indiscriminate uptake of artificial intelligence in the future. So do we have a way out? As we mentioned a couple of times, Access Now has published multiple materials to show guidance for governments and companies how to use data and technology in a manner that respects human rights. We also reacted to the rise of hate speech and misinformation. We are part of a Europe-wide litigation effort to enforce access to information and data protection rights about COVID apps. We also fight against internet shutdowns. I can share all these materials in the chat or elsewhere, but for a true change, a chance to heal most of our societies, we need more than these recommendations. We need to challenge existing power relationships. Instead of reminding you of the Harari quote again, I'd like to quote another modern classic to finish, Chris Rock. He said last weekend, just two days ago in his Saturday Night Live monologue uh, as a host, I think we need to renegotiate our relationship to the government. I fully agree. And we should keep in mind that in the 21st century, when we talk about power of governments, we can't ignore how our societies rely on technology and private companies behind it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fanny. I, I think you've hit on so many of the key points that, that we're all thinking about and struggling with. And, and like it or not, of course, the, the pandemic has forced to the forefront some challenges and issues that were already present and that we were struggling to adapt to and sort of put them on a, a faster pace. And, and uh, as you've said, uh, raises some, some major concerns about how we've gone forward. I also wonder at some point if we could get back to your comment about the fact that the difference in take up on different apps hasn't been uh, much related to the, the difference in the types of apps that are there. And, and I think that is somewhat telling as to that whole transparency and available information question, which I think we struggle with a lot in this space. Um, we've got a lot of experts on this call, but for the uh, people in the population generally, I think there are a lot of questions. 
Um, and uh, here's some, we'll turn to somebody who has a lot of answers. Um, one of our, again, co-organizers, we're so happy to have with us Robert Kirkpatrick, who's the director of UN Global Pulse. Uh, as you all probably know, UN Global Pulse uh, co-chair is the UN Privacy Policy Group and has been very active in this space. Over to you, Robert. Thank you, Peggy. Um, so I'd, yeah, I'd like to start off noting um, you know, Excellencies, colleagues and friends, we're very excited to be sharing this discussion with you today. Um, I'd like to thank our co-champion uh, sponsor member states, including the government of Finland, France, uh, and the Republic of Korea, as well as the European Union, and our co-organizers, UN Human Rights and Access Now, for making this important event happen. Uh, COVID has been the great accelerator. This is something everybody's really talking about, accelerator of both the good and the bad um, around data and artificial intelligence. Um, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, data sharing, whether mandatory or voluntary, has become a widespread practice in response to the crisis. So for example, one type of data that we've seen become quite prevalent in, in the past decade as a result of people carrying around location-aware mobile devices loaded with apps uh, is real-time information on patterns of population movement, so-called mobility information. Whether used for purposes such as monitoring the spread of COVID-19, improving healthcare resources management and distribution, uh, or monitoring the degree to which social distancing measures are being complied with, mobility information combined with the use of artificial intelligence has had in a number of cases um, you know, success in demonstrating its value in efforts to contain the virus. The Secretary General uh, in his roadmap for digital cooperation has called for the accelerated use of data and AI as digital public goods especially to address the impacts of the global pandemic. In his policy brief on human rights and COVID-19, he stresses that human rights are key in shaping the pandemic response, both for the public health emergency and the broader impact on people's lives and livelihoods. According to the Global Privacy Assembly Task Force on COVID-19, an official global forum on data protection of data protection authorities, the pressing privacy issues that have emerged as a result of the pandemic include for example, contact tracing, including digital contact tracing, which have been given the highest priority by authorities to date. Handling of employee data in work from home or return to work situations. Handling of children's and students data associated with the use of e-learning and online schooling technologies. And sharing of health data between hospitals and health ministries and other relevant government bodies. So while the processing of personal data through the use of artificial intelligence is certainly excellent, accelerated in light of the pandemic, policies on data sharing and use for emergency response are still falling behind. The law, as is often the case, is not caught up with AI and its ability to impact our rights in ways both positive and negative. Many countries are still lacking regulatory frameworks specific enough to allow for an agile and at the same time privacy mindful use of AI and data for humanitarian response. This gap not only prevents the use of data and AI in a privacy respecting manner, but it prevents its use at all, for example, in, the, in ways that could benefit those most in need of help. More countries today need AI and data strategies that include frameworks for the deployment of AI and data sharing for humanitarian response in a human rights respectful manner. And these frameworks need to differentiate between the routine use of data um, uh, you know, of, of AI and data sharing um, and in non-emergency contexts. Investments need to be made in scaling up the use of contact tracing technologies that preserve privacy. Some applications developed in the past few months, for example, can leverage the power of highly detailed, accurate, and widespread data to fight viral infections without putting individuals at risk by exposing their sensitive data. From an operational perspective inside the UN, uh, Global Pulse has been working over the past few months to establish the now officially launched Crisis Insights Team, which is a cross-pillar data analytics and artificial intelligence initiative to support the UN system's uh, system-wide approach uh, to responding to the crisis. Um, the CIT, as we call it, the Crisis Insights Team, uh, works on a, a three main areas. One, providing an analytics framework and toolkit to support response and recovery from crises through integration of strategic analysis and data analytics. Two, forming strategic partnerships around information priorities to create access to off-the-shelf solutions, big data, and cutting-edge analytical approaches. 
um, and third, supporting communications functions across the UN system through science-based evidence and data-driven insights. The United Nations principles on personal data protection and privacy developed through the Privacy Policy Group provide a guiding framework on how data can be used in a privacy respectful manner, including through the use of AI, minimizing the negative impact, not only on individuals, but also on groups. The, um, uh, this, the UN Privacy Policy Group continues to support work on clarifying best practices and the applications of the above mentioned principles in specific to COVID-19. Uh, the World Health Organization also came out with a guide on ethical considerations to guide the use of digital proximity tracking technologies for COVID-19 contact tracing and is developing these guide guidelines on data sharing in emergencies and many other organizations across the UN system, including UN Human Rights, UNHCR, IOM, UNICEF, UNOCHA, and UNESCO have come out with guidelines on data practices in the context of COVID-19. So the key concept here that needs to be embraced in the fight against today's crisis and future crises using data and AI is ensuring trust. And this is a point that's come up. Right? Trust is reasonable and human rights respectful, um, trust in reasonable and human rights respectful use of these digital tools. Um, this can be achieved by adhering to the common data privacy and protection principles, including fairness, transparency, and accountability. Any exception to the data protection and privacy principles uh, used during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, need to be limited in time and cease as soon as the crisis is over. Data collected under these, under these exceptions should be deleted, right? Data collection and use needs to be proportional to what's necessary. So um, I think finally a point to make here is that, uh, you know, transparency has a key role to play here. Data use, especially at the time of emergency response needs to ensure that individuals impacted by data usage are made aware of the data processing practices, its benefits and its purposes. Without protecting human rights, including the right to privacy, we will not be able to ensure a future in which uh, data really is a global good that can benefit society and help prevent the next crisis. Great, thank you so much, Robert. You uh, put a lot in there for us to think about and including your points about uh, where we stand on the regulatory frameworks and uh, the information you provided about some of the efforts underway within the UN system on these points and uh, a lot for us to, to look at moving forward on how we pull these pieces together in a way that's a bit more coherent potentially than some of the existing efforts and the focus between non-emergency settings and you know what additional protections are appropriate when we know that things will be rolled out quickly. So um, we'll turn to our last speaker on the panel now. We're very fortunate to have with us Dr. Eduardo Bertoni, who's the Director of National Access to Public Information Agency in Argentina. Um, he's also well known to many of us as the former Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression for the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and as the founder and director of the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information at Palermo University School of Law. Over to you, Eduardo. Thank you very much. I hope that everybody can hear me well. Um, let me start thanking the organizers, uh, particularly the UN Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights and the UN Global Polls, and uh, also Access Now, uh, a prestigious, very prestigious international NGO. And thank you, Peggy, for moderating this panel. And it's an honor for me to be with my colleagues in this panel. Uh, as you say, I am the director of the Access to Public Information Agency. I would like just to mention that in Argentina, since 2017, the Data Protection Authority is the Access to Public Information Agency. It is not in our name. Uh, however, it is the DPA in Argentina, as I said, since 2017. I always like to clarify that because people can think that we are just dealing with access to public information. No, we are uh, created as an independent and autonomous authority in Argentina. And many people mention trust here in this particular time. And I think that trust is also linked to have, to have uh, independent authorities in the of data protection. Today, I will share with you some actions that we were 
doing just in relation to the topic of this virtual meeting, which is digital pandemic surveillance and the right to privacy. Particularly, I will talk on two specific actions that we did. First is in relation with an application that we call Quiz R, which in Spanish is, uh, in English is something like take care. Second, I will talk about what people here mention as a cyber patrol protocol. But before going to these examples on what we did, it is important to clarify that in Argentina, at the federal level, I underscore federal level, we did not find compulsory tracking application, but instead, instead what we call complementary tools. Remember that Argentina is a federal government, so I am not to mention some aspects of this issue that are taking place in our provinces. So let's go on what we did on the application Quid R. Application Quid R is an application developed by the Secretary of Innovation of the government. And it was developed for different purposes. First, self-diagnosis. Second, issuance of certificates to circulate during the mandatory quarantine. And third, information to users about the closest health centers. We did an official investigation to this app from technical and legal aspect, and particularly regarding geolocalization data. And we conclude that first, the application is optional, so that processing of geolocalization personal data depends on the consent of the user. And second, geolocalization data is optional and can be activated manually by users who wish that their geolocalization data is used by the app to have the nearest health center, care center, sorry, contact him or her if needed. So we did not find uh, important problems on this application in relation to our regulations. Remember that Argentina is also a state party of the Convention 108 of the Council of Europe. So our law, which is a law from the year 2000, uh, is complemented by the Convention 108. Let's move to the second action, which is that we have evaluated a general protocol for the police prevention of crime, also known here in Argentina as the Cyber Patrol Protocol, created by the Ministry of Security. Its main purpose was to monitor possible criminal behavior in relation to the public emergency regarding the COVID-19. For example, citizen compliance with mandatory social quarantine during the pandemic, in this sense, the protocol states that the police and police prevention activities would be carried out the review of, and I'm quoting, public and unclassified digital media. As a result of our analysis, we warned the Ministry of Security that, one, personal data in open digital sources is also protected under our regulation and therefore they must comply with the principles of proportionality, data quality, information, security, and confidentiality among others. Second, the scope of the protocol is too broad as it is meant to pursue the investigation of crimes related to the compliance of mandatory lockdown and at the same time of crimes that are not linked to the pandemic and which also carry more severe penalties, such as terrorism or money laundering. Third, the protocol does not specify how the prevention tasks would be carried out in practice, nor which categories of data would be collected. And finally, four, how to confirm that the information collect collected is reliable and what would be consequences of the processing for data subjects. So 
in order to adapt the protocol to the current regulations, we recommended, among other aspects of our recommendation that is published in our website, the following things. First, we recommended to narrow down the purpose of the protocol in order to apply the protocol only to pur pursue crimes that are severe enough to justify an interference of the privacy and individuals of individuals. Second, we recommend to clarify what are the criminal indicators that will be used in accordance with the principles of necessity and proportionality. Third, we recommended to clarify whether an automated processing tool will be used to collect information and if applicable, to put in place appropriate safeguards. Four, we recommended to clarify what mechanisms will be used to classify an individual's behavior in reliable and fair manner. Fifth, we recommended whenever data is stored under the protocol, the ministry should carry out periodic reviews to analyze the pertinence and necessity of the data according to the purposes for which they were collected. Six, we recommended that the exercise of rights of access, rectification, suppression, and information, and the information principle of the data subjects must be guaranteed. And seventh, we recommended to implement impact assessment um, process, identifying the risk to individuals' privacy and what safeguards will be used to mitigate them according that the protocol involves large scale data processing. Finally, we requested the Ministry of Security to suspend the application of the protocol under the current conditions until the protocol is amended so as to comply with the obligation of our data protection law and international standards and international agreements. To this end, the agency offered the ministry its collaboration. Last week, we had a conversation with people at the ministry and they want to organize some working sessions with their team and our teams to discuss all of our recommendations. Thanks for your attention and I am open for questions and clarification of what we have been doing during this particular time at the global level. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Eduardo. I think it's really helpful to understand how these things work in practice. And so your uh, analysis there of the, the work that the, the authority did on those two specific applications, I think is, is really useful for, for all those listening. So that's the end of our, our panel. We have with us, fortunately, three uh, high level commentators who we've asked to give short remarks on uh, the um, the comments by the panel and the discussion today. So we'll turn directly to them now. And I have the pleasure to welcome first Ambassador Sangbum Lim, who's the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Permanent Mission of the Republic of Korea to the United Nations. Over to you, Ambassador. Um, thank you, uh, Director Fix. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Access Now, UN Global Pulse, and OHCHR for organizing this event. Uh, let me also thank distinguished panelists uh, for their outstanding presentation and insights. Uh, Korea is honored uh, to join as a co-sponsoring state of this milestone event and also uh, as one of the champions of the 3A slash B round table on digital human rights. In the past few months of fighting against COVID-19, the many factors of digital technology have helped accelerate our response to the pandemic from its application to online learning uh, for children uh, to virtual platforms and telecommuting. However, uh, the same technology has also revealed some potential human rights implications. For example, contact tracing has been an invaluable tool for many countries in slowing down the pandemic, but it could be uh, detrimental to the privacy of the patients or those being traced when the information is misused. In this regard, I would like to share Korea's perspective 
uh, and efforts toward securing public health and safeguarding the right to privacy in this unprecedented time. First, as underlined in the roadmap for digital cooperation presented by the Secretary General this June, uh, it is imperative to ensure effective personal data protection in line with internationally agreed standards with appropriate human right-based domestic laws and practices. In the case of Korea, based on our lessons learned from uh, the, the MERS outbreak in 2015, we revised the Infectious Disease Control and Prevention Act to allow health authorities to collect data on persons who are infected and to disclose uh, certain data under limited situations to ensure the public the right to know. Measures taken uh, in accordance with this law have enabled us to satisfy the government health policy requirements and the public's rights to information as highlighted in the report of the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to freedom of expression in this uh, April. In particular, to address privacy concerns related uh, to the collection of personal data to Korea, the Disease Control and Prevention Agency uh, has established the specific guidelines on the time frame and the scope of publicly accessible information to ensure the necessity and proportionality of those measures. These measures uh, include uh, deleting contact movement information of confirmed cases after 14 days and also deleting data involved uh, once all contact routes have been identified. Also, the Personal Information Protection Commission has undergone a thorough inspection on the risk of possible data breach during the pandemic. Recently, in September, the Commission announced strengthened guidelines for COVID-19 related personal information and is making continuous efforts to improve and implement guidelines regarding the protection of privacy and personal information. Second, I would like to highlight the vital role of the UN Human Rights Council and its mechanisms in raising awareness of human rights-based approach in the use of new technologies. In the 44th session this July, we held a panel discussion on this issue uh, with the participation of diverse uh, stakeholders, including OHCHR Advisory Committee, Microsoft, and uh, Tarasio the Digitals. In particular, OHCHL has a crucial role uh, in developing system-wide guidance on human rights, due diligence, and impact assessments. Uh, we should advance the issue forward, for which Korea will play its part by presenting the second ROK-led resolution on new technologies next year. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, ensuring transparency and trust in digital technology requires a holistic and multi-stakeholder approach uh, of the entire global community. The Republic of Korea will continue to actively cooperate with the UN bodies, government, and the private sector in the follow-up process of digital cooperation roadmap while placing human rights at the center of our efforts to counter the challenges of COVID-19. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you, of course, for the Republic of Korea's support for these processes and, as you noted, for the, the work here at the Human Rights Council in Geneva. I'd like to turn now to Ambassador Henri Verdier from uh, France, the Ambassador for Digital Affairs. Over to you, Ambassador. <clears throat> thank you very much, and uh, bonsoir tout le monde. As my, like my friend and colleague uh, from Korea, I first want to address a special thanks to the organizers of this valuable event, Global Pulse, Access Now, and the High Commissioner for Human Rights. France is very proud to co-sponsor this event on such a critical topic, especially in time like this, where there is a risk of a surveillance pandemic, as the UN Special Rapporteur, Joe Kanatachi, stated in his last report. One of France's top priorities is to promote a digital world well balanced between growth, security, and the protection of human rights and civil liberties. We acknowledge that the digital revolution offers new tools that impact human rights. These tools were designed to empower the people and to share knowledge, and they have a lot of positive impact. They open up new spaces for the exercise of human rights and offer an opportunity for the achievement of sustainable goals. 
but the new technologies can also be, be used in a detrimental way with regards to human rights and civil liberties, deliberately or accidentally. The COVID-19 is a catalyz catalyzing event in that matter. States and other actors growingly use new technologies, among, among which artificial intelligence and personal data, to curb the pandemic. On the other hand, when used without care for human rights, failing to meet the criteria of necessity and proportionality, or forgetting to protect confidential medical information, these tools can turn into a general surveillance or in automatic decision with risk of bias or without accountability of democratic decision. Two very different models of digital governance threaten democracy and human rights. First, a monopolistic model in which states are sidelined by tech giants that pretend to be self-regulating. And may maybe they are, and maybe they do a great job, but democracy requires deliberation and contradiction. On the opposite, there is a second model in which states firmly control each and every digital activity within their boundaries. In fact, both models are threatening the exercise of human rights and civil liberties. France and the European Union actively promote a third way, a multi-stakeholder approach that allows states and through them the relevant international organization and first of them the United Nations in constant interaction with civil society and companies to regulate the use of new technologies according to the existing international right and humanitarian law that fully applies in the digital world. Therefore, we support international initiative for human rights based use of new technologies that are mounted in multilateral fora such as the United Nations, UNESCO, the Council of Europe, OECD, or G7. But this way needs transparency and accountability. In this regard, together with 15 countries, France, France has launched in June 2020 the Global Partnership on AI, aiming at promoting principles for human rights-based governance of AI. It's just a beginning, and we think that we will have to prepare a digital bill of rights, including AI, privacy, algorithmic governance, automatic decision, diversity in tech, and a lot of other issues. At national or regional level, it is of utmost importance that the legal framework provides safeguards when it comes to the use of digital technologies and personal data. In that matter, the European Union proved to be a pioneer with its general regulation on data protection, the GDPR. France actively supports the current European efforts to promote a digital model that respects our fundamental values and rights. And this year, we'll have, to, we'll have projects to regulate systemic platforms and to protect democracy. Some of you did express concerns about freedom of speech. We share these concerns. But we also have to face that infodemic. I agree that instead of controlling the speeches, we should, try, we should first try to promote and to protect independent information and to have a serious conversation with the social networks about their algorithms. And last idea, we believe that the first step to ensure human rights based use of new technologies and the respect of right to privacy is to have a robust, independent national supervisory authority. France Commission Nationale Informatique et Liberté protects personal data, supports innovation, preserves individual liberties since 1978, and is constantly adapting to new challenges, last of which the COVID pandemic. As co-champion of the Roundtable on AI, France is dedicated to bring forward the UN roadmap on digital cooperation and call all states to get involved in designing a human rights-based digital governance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It's, it's wonderful to hear from you. and to hear, uh, as you said, both about sort of the, the national structural solutions and possibilities, um, linking in well with some of what we've heard about the regulatory frameworks and needs, um, but also that, that global component and, and how that uh, factors into how we look at the solutions going forward. 
So our final commentator, I'd like to turn to Ambassador Anne-Marie Antoff Larsen, who is the tech ambassador for the Kingdom of Denmark, and I understand is is recently in that post. So we're very fortunately to ha uh, fortunate to have you with us, Ambassador, to to start off uh, with with this panel. I'm uh, glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peggy. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for an incredibly important and timely debate. Overall, Denmark also welcomes the Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation and multi-stakeholder initiatives on the protection of personal data and the promotion of digital rights, not least as we look into the current pandemic and how to navigate it, but also beyond. We believe that the roadmap really strikes a good balance between challenges and opportunities of digital transformation in the 21st century. I want to start by saying that Denmark really welcomes this panel and the discussions today, uh, strong assertion that human rights apply online as well as offline. Um, as we look into some of the challenges to navigate, it is crucial that we ensure freedom of speech while combating hate speech based on the principle of non-discrimination. Surveillance, repression, censorship, and online harassment by both state and non-state actors often made more effective by digital technologies must be substituted by protection and promotion of human rights. As we seek to navigate this pandemic, this has never been more true. We must do that through concerted efforts from both the international society, but also from more societal responsibility and from a proactive engagement by the tech industry itself. As we navigate and seek to manage and maneuver this pandemic, it is important that legislation and safeguards are in place to protect people from unlawful and unnecessary civilians. It is critical that the response measures are aligned with human rights, but also that compliance with human rights is incorporated early into the design phase of all relevant products and services we use to manage and address COVID-19. The discussion today, not least on contract tracing apps, shows how important that is. In short and in conclusion, Denmark firmly believes that we can't do this individually and on a case by case and country by country level alone, but this requires global collaboration. We are ready to re reaffirm our commitment to this work and to work with all of you on this incredibly important and timely agenda and on implementing the Secretary General's roadmap. Uh, and we will be very happy to share both our experiences, but moreover, looking forward to collaborating with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for those uh, insightful comments and for, for that offer of, of engagement as we go forward. Um, so we do have a couple of minutes, unfortunately not much more for, for a few questions and we have a, uh, several that have been fielded in the, in the chat. Uh, the first one was actually directed specifically towards uh, Alexandria Walden from, from Google, um, but others might want to come in on, but I'll turn to you first, Alex. Um, Everett Monroe had, had asked about um, how the developer terms of service would be enforced in practice. Um, it seems like the terms might be violated and the API access could be terminated, but the data is still out there and might be misused and wanted to get your thoughts on, on that particular point. Sure. Um, oh, it looks like I may have lost everyone. Um, so with respect to how we enforce our terms of service, that's something that we are used to doing because we have um, the Google Play Store. And so we have um, teams of reviewers that evaluate and ensure that um, apps that are in our Play Store are um, there in alignment with our, with our terms of service and the policy, developer policies. And so similarly, with respect to um, the exposure notifications API, there are staff in place who review um, the apps to ensure that they are consistently uh, aligned with the terms of service and to the extent they are no longer consistent with our terms of service, then there is a period for review and correction. And if it uh, goes uncorrected, then um, access to the API would be rescinded. Great. Thank you very much, Alex. And um, we had, a, we had a, a, I think, an important question from Ali Abdullah uh, with the uh, Muwatana uh, Human Rights NGO in Yemen, 
Um, and he asked, uh, technological development is almost non-existent in Yemen, so violators of the right to privacy often come from outside the country, such as companies or government institutions that cross borders, especially during the spread of COVID-19. So they want, he um, asked about uh, what efforts are being done to protect the right to privacy in countries like Yemen and how to hold uh, violators accountable if they're outside the borders of the state. So I wonder uh, if any of our commentators or, or our panelists would like to come in on that point in, in particular. Uh, perhaps Fanny, would you uh, start us off? Sure. So um, unfortunately, it's not a effective uh, means yet, but it would be, for instance, the European Union's utmost responsibility to pass the reform of the recast of the dual use or export controls regulation that is in the final trialogue phase in Brussels right now. And it doesn't have adequate human rights uh, criteria right now to protect people's uh, rights outside the European Union by technology that is, uh, that is uh, sold uh, or um, produced in uh, European or by European companies. So we are fighting for this reform to be improved and passed very quickly. Thank you very much. Does anyone else on the panel want to come in on that question? If so, just uh, raise your hand. I ought to be able to see you on my view. Uh, yes, please, Eduardo. Thank you, Peggy. I think that this is a very, very important question and is not only related to this uh, particular moment of the pandemic that we are living. Uh, the thing is that uh, the protection of privacy and personal data today uh, means a global protection. It's very difficult to work just locally. So one development or one important development uh, that uh, we were and we are involved is to uh, be a state party of international agreements. And unfortunately, up to now, a specific uh, treaty on this area is the treaty coming from the Council of Europe, the Convention 108, which is open to all the countries, even though they are not part of the Council of Europe. When I say unfortunately, I'm saying that because it will be desirable that the UN at some point start working on a treaty for the protection of privacy uh, and, that, and personal data in the digital age, for example. Um, when we apply our law and our uh, situation in Argentina, uh, we can include uh, international uh, enterprises, and we did in the past. We sanctioned some international companies in the past, applying our law and the Convention 108. Of course, it is some reluctance to that, and enforcement is not that easy. I agree with that. So that is the importance of cooperation and international agreement. Uh, Finally, I would say that even in, in countries that are not state party of the Convention 108 and they don't have specific legislation of that uh, realm, on this realm, data protection, uh, it is always possible to use the universal system for the protection of human rights, the ICCPR, when they, uh, the covenant provide with protection of privacy uh, or a regional uh, systems, the European system, the inter-American system. So even if you don't have a specific regulation on data protection, if it is a violation of privacy, you can always use the international, uh, the international covenants, the universal declaration, the ICCPR and other instruments. And they were very well interpreted uh, both by the special rapporteur on the right to privacy and also by the special rapporteur on the right to freedom of expression. So you can use those tools as well. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Eduardo. Uh, we are actually um, going to need to turn quite quickly to our concluding comments by each of the panelists. Um, we do have some extra questions, so I'm going to just uh, throw those out to you. And if you could bring them into your final comments, that would be great. There was a point specifically relating to what Eduardo was just speaking about which is about the um, 
obligations that can be imposed on, on technology companies and is there a need for a legally binding treaty. Um, now we only have about one minute for each of you, so please uh, try to keep your, your remarks brief, but uh, if you could uh, throw that in in your answer, that would be wonderful as well. I'm gonna turn to you, uh, Robert Kirkpatrick first, because I understand you might have to, to leave us shortly. Over to you, Robert. Yes, thank you, Peggy. Um, I mean, I think, see, very, very briefly, I think, you know, we, de we definitely need new frameworks here. Um, that can help ensure and build trust. Um, this is really, really important. And, and um, you know, we need these frameworks to be able to do a couple of things. I mean, one um, is clearly to make sure that privacy and other human rights are protected, um, uh, you know, in their application. Um, but I think it's also important, you know, we've seen the need for speed in response in COVID-19. I mean, by analogy, look at all of the applications um, that are happening in the fields of genetics and artificial intelligence around vaccine development right now, right? We need to be able to innovate. And so we need frameworks that are simultaneously uh, conducive to rapid and widespread innovation, and yet aren't throwing privacy and human rights under the bus in the process, right? Now, I mean, does that seem like, um, you know, a paradox? I, my, my greatest fear is this kind of zombie uh, contact tracing applications when the news cycle moves on and these applications remain in place as the pandemic winds down, they'll continue to be used in ways that are invisible to the average person on the street and, and, and accountability won't exist. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, there have been really exciting innovations in the field of privacy protecting computation in the past few years, including homomorphic encryption, zero knowledge proofs, secure multi-party computation. These systems make it possible to use data and even train machine learning algorithms without ever directly accessing or decrypting sensitive data. A growing number of the applications are decentralized platforms uh, based on blockchain to give individuals greater control and data sovereignty and to prevent increasing uh, increased centralization of data storage and processing in the hands of companies and governments. So, you know, in the years ahead, I suspect there will be no rationale for directly capturing and using people's personal data for applications like contact tracing, even during a life-threatening pandemic. Great. Thank you, Robert, for those insightful comments and, and bringing in that, that hopeful perspective that the technology will actually catch up and, and give us options uh, in terms of protection of data that, that you know, are not fully in place now. Um, I'm going to go to the, the panelists in, in reverse order. So that would mean that I, I go to you, uh, Eduardo Bertoni, next. Thank you so much for your, your comments and participation and just one minute for a, a final takeaway point. Thank you, Peggy. Thanks again for organizing this important event. Uh, as I said, what people call the digital age or the digital era requires different frameworks or probably more frameworks. Uh, what they, I mentioned the Council of Europe initiative when the Convention 108 and the Convention 108 plus, which is something, uh, is, the, is the renew, renewal of the, of the Convention 108, uh, but also the European Union, when the European Union passed the GDPR, the new data protection regulation, also include a new analysis of the uh, adequate countries uh, that are in accordance with the GDPR. This is something that Argentina is also working in. It is an adequate country for the European Union since 2003, uh, but we are in the process of the revision uh, that the European Union is doing. So why I'm mentioning that? I'm mentioning that because what we need is a more global approach of the problem. Uh, and the UN, uh, it's important to, for me, my perspective, it's important that the UN uh, play an important role in that realm, but, but, on my final statement, we already have principles and well-established principles for the protection of human rights coming from different international uh, declarations or treaties. I mentioned here the Universal Declaration. I can mention the ICCPR as, as I did. And we also have a regional treaties that are very important. So we cannot say that just because 
we don't have a comprehensive treaty that is going to be applicable in the digital era, the human rights of the people are not protected. On the contrary, they are very well protected. We need to do a uh, no, uh, actual uh, current interpretation of the, of the treaties, of the declarations, and we need to apply those uh, systems even though we don't have an international agreement specifically for the digital era. We need that. It would be important for enforcement. It would be important to clarify many aspects. But human rights are protected under the framework of the international system. Thank you. Wonderful, Eduardo, and, and you saved me uh, some of the, the remarks that I would, I would close with in terms of that underlying Human Rights Foundation. So thank you very much for that. I'll turn now to Fanny Hedbegi from Access Now. Thank you. So um, I'd like to conclude with saying that the end of the pandemic is not clear yet and the and whether locally globally and it's the same for these emergency or extraordinary or unprecedented or whatever adjective we want to use for the measures that were put in place that we don't see their end uh, either and we need to recognize that for some communities these violations that we call extraordinary measures have been part of their everyday lives for a long time. So I think there will be two challenges. First, to correct the wrongs and reinforce human rights rule of law and democracy uh, that we rolled back or some governments rolled back uh, as a consequence of, of the crisis and the pandemic. But uh, that correction cannot go back to the previous status quo because that status quo was never, never adequate for those principles and values for, for all human beings um, on this planet. And I think for the European Union, this is true for the EU member states, and we need to do much better in enforcing our rules. We always call them European values, but these are not just values, these are fundamental rights enshrined in legal documents that must be enforced. And uh, we also have responsibilities for consequences outside our borders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fanny, and, and uh, really compelling uh, ideas in terms of that, the not allowing the new normal to continue, but also really evaluating where we started from and the need to improve there as well. Over to you, Alex Walden of Google. Thanks, Peggy. Um, I think the, best way for me to include is really just to underscore the key role of human rights standards and human rights experts in informing companies as we are seeking to develop projects to solve global problems, whether they are public health crises or other things. Um, for us, in the projects that we've developed around COVID-19, human rights due diligence is, of course, ongoing. And so we are continuing our evaluation of these projects and we are continuing our conversations with experts around how these projects are continuing to be used. Um, and so I think it's important for companies like ours and any other companies that are producing projects to address COVID-19 related issues to be sure that they're centering human rights concerns as early as possible in the development of their projects and that they're centering user control and privacy and transparency and of course, um, considerations around uh, information integrity. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Alex. And, and we didn't uh, have a chance to get to one of the points that um, I had hoped to ask you about, but uh, I do think that the Google Apple collaboration um, is also an interesting point. One of the things that, that we've often, often talked about is the, the need to make sure that it's not a, we're not doing that human rights analysis and corporation design on a company by company basis, but that we're learning from each other as well. And as many of you know, um, our office has a project uh, focusing on some of those issues called BTEC, where we're looking to apply the UN uh, guiding principles on business and human rights in this context. Um, Patricia, you've been very patient. I'm sorry to, to keep you waiting. Uh, Patricia, I do so 
Hoku from, from Ghana. It's, it's been wonderful to have you with us. I hope it's been a, a good conversation from your perspective as well, and uh, would love to hear your concluding remark. So this is very enlightening for me, and somehow it comforts me to know that we're not the only ones who are a bit at a loss as to what the actual answer to this issue is, that we're all uh, continuously discussing and recommending the best ways forward. And as I said, listen, listening to my uh, colleagues, I'm thinking of um, what is possibly uh, some of the key uh, takeaways for me from here. And I'm thinking it's not all bad news because we, the world uh, globally have had the chance to learn uh, or test out uh, with this pandemic, how we stand together to address challenging issues uh, and to really test out the, the, the value of having data protection laws uh, and, and privacy as a fundamental human right. I think um, uh, at this time and looking forward to the post pandemic period, I want to be able to uh, believe that the real test of, of whether we have stood the, 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 the test of time as privacy experts is to look at how retrospectively individuals will be able to assert themselves uh, as, if, uh, as, as what happens with every post-war period uh, about how their human rights have been uh, respected during this period and how much support they get uh, to address the retrospective uh, uh, issues that they raise. We also look at the, the as a, to set a global standard around the use of tools and use of new technology uh, and, and also the, the use of artificial intelligence in our time and in addressing uh, world level issues. I'm also, uh, for the African region, seeing this as a challenge and, and a presentation of a situation to African leaders on to how they must speed up and scale up the implementation of data protection laws for the region, knowing that there is a lot of work ahead for us. Uh, and, and at this time, I'm not sure if you're all aware, but I'd like to uh, also mention that Africa is looking at harmonizing data protection laws as has been done in Europe. And um, we've got to the stage where Ghana has been selected as a pilot nation to pilot the harmonized law. And I think it's really timely considering that uh, certain standards have to be uh, set on, on what our expectations are as, as supervisory authorities and the reasonable expectations of people uh, in respecting their rights in this region. Also, Ghana is the uh, case study uh, country at the same time for the UN Global Pause for monitoring the ethics of AI. And I think all of this is coming together as we uh, discuss uh, on a global level how we're handling this pandemic and the use of technology. And, and I think there's a lot of learning and, and, and best practice to be drawn out in the months to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate your perspective and, and that final point about the, the piloting in, in Ghana and the harmonization, I think really harkens back to some of what we we're saying about the need to, to really figure out how we better learn. I hope we've done a little bit of that learning and discussion in, in the context of this panel. I want to thank um, our experts and commentators for their insightful comments, for taking time out of their days as to all of all of those listening who have participated. I, I want to have a specific shout out to Laura O'Brien of Access Now and Mila Romanoff from UN Global Pulse who helped put this uh, panel together and, and devoted considerable uh, expertise and, and action to it. And of course, to our co-sponsors, the EU, the Republic of Korea, Finland, and France uh, for making this event possible today. Thank you all. We've opened a lot of questions. We haven't answered them all, but uh, food for thought going forward and uh, good luck with the rest of your days. Take care. <laughs>